You know, listen to your parents. If your father tells you not to invade a foreign country, don't do it. We're going to talk about that and many other things on this special questions episode. Nine years of doing this program, talking into a mic, and many of you through that time, or part of that time, listening. This all started in 2006. I was a 35-year-old then. I am uh, 43, going on 44-year-old now. <laughs> Worked at a radio station country station, actually, in New Jersey, very small one. 1070 AM, the best country this side of Texas. When podcasting came out, I just jumped on it immediately. I mean, I wasn't the pioneer. I remember listening to, like, History According to Bob and a couple other programs. I read a book, and the book said, write down the group of things that you like. I'm actually a literature major, and that was one of the things. I actually went to Richard Stockton College of New Jersey. Now they call it Stockton University or time I went, it was called Stockton State College. I was on the radio station there, WLFR, Lake Fred Radio. But I always had a side love of history and politics. I'd watch C-SPAN, read tons of history books, always have. So I decided to mix history and politics and put them together in a cast. It was going to be called History Sandwich. Well, at least that was one of the names on the list. That was probably one of the leading contenders. And then I decided my history can beat up your politics, because the whole idea is that by giving you some layers of history behind a subject, perhaps you'll have a more complex view. It's been nine years, and I want to thank those who have listened for so long. I thank everybody who has supported the program, and you can support the program at www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. If you haven't done so yet, please go and donate. Thanks. For the archive of My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, we ask for a donation of $25 or more. I'm going to take a bunch of questions in celebration of our ninth anniversary, but so many of them seem to be about Biden, Sanders, Trump. New Hampshire and Iowa are coming up, and uh, it's always a good time for political trends. Rob Neal asks me, after seeing speculation that Biden might jump in the race, I did a little research and found that only four times in our nation's history has a sitting VP run for president and won, and only once, in the last 179 years. That sounds like a daunting stat for Biden. But what I couldn't find, given the limited nature of my research, was how often the VP has run at all. Is it just a recent phenomenon that the Veep is expected to run, Dick Cheney notwithstanding? Okay, Rob, great question, thank you. So yeah, we got Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, George H.W. Bush, and yes, that man who must be the patron saint. Of all VPs who would like to be president, Martin Van Buren. Just four. So the historical record looks ugly, but it's not as bad as it looks. For instance, one of those is very recent, George H.W. Bush, 1988. Richard Nixon didn't win as a sitting VP, but he won eight years later. Al Gore won the popular vote, indicating some amount of popularity, if not luck. And there's other mitigating factors. For instance, some VPs were elevated by the death of a president. So they never got a chance to run. They just became president. And some presidents didn't get two terms. Thus, they didn't provide a good point of departure for their VPs. Now, Mondale tried as a former VP to run, and Carter was only a one-term president. He didn't make it. But the most important factor is that, as you say, it's fairly recent that the VP is even expected to run. In the 19th century, this was rarely the case. So we don't know a lot about William Wheeler, Garrett Hobart, or the like. So you put all of those factors together that really in the 19th century it didn't run, and I don't think at all that people have a problem voting for a VP. The change starts with Elvin Barkley in 1952. Truman elevates the VP office because he was a VP. He didn't know a thing about what was going on. He didn't know about the Manhattan Project when FDR was still alive. He decides to involve Barkley in everything. Meetings on the Hill, National Security Council. So when Richard Nixon became president... That kind of forced Eisenhower's hand. Eisenhower is also aware of his age and wants to make sure Nixon is in on events. But in the Eisenhower administration, it's pretty clear Nixon's going to run. He runs, doesn't win, 
So that's where the change occurred. Now, I just think that 1988 tells you what you want to know. You know, everyone's saying, oh, there's only one in 179 years. Well, that tells you what you want to know. A VP can win because it's going to be based on the administration that they were a member of and how voters perceive the performance. And if they like the performance, I think they can vote for a VP, prominent senator, secretary of state, anyone that's running on that party's label. So it was with George H.W. Bush. Should Biden run? Should he not run? I'm not going to answer that one. Should he not run because he's a VP? Absolutely not. Well, in 1803, a New Jersey senator, Jonathan Dayton, moved to actually eliminate this question because he moved to eliminate the vice presidency. And he wasn't laughed out of the room when he did it. He wasn't a fluky backbencher looking for a few lines in the newspaper. He was a Federalist, former Speaker of the House of Representatives. And he had a role in creating the office of vice president because Jonathan Dayton was a member of the Constitutional Convention. When he made that proposal, there was interest. For procedural reasons, he wasn't successful. And maybe that's a good thing, because his distant relation, William Dayton, would run for vice president 53 years later. Nick Brandau asks me on Twitter, where I am, by the way, at at myhist, at M-Y-H-I-S-T. Nick Brandau asks me, at myhist, I love the show and the archive. Have you covered how or why the runner-up in presidential elections no longer serves as vice president? Thanks, Nick. Strictly speaking, it's the 12th Amendment. The second change made beyond the Bill of Rights, the first was the 11th, which had to do with the judiciary. The background of the 12th Amendment is the election of 1800. Aaron Burr, Thomas Jefferson get an equal number of votes, even though it was supposed to be understood by most Republicans voting that Jefferson was to be president, Aaron Burr vice president. The House then goes through 36 ballots and does not pick a president. This is a real odd situation. Now, some people ask Aaron Burr to step down. Some people ask him to say, if I am offered the presidency, I will not take it. For reasons of honor, for loyalty to the republic, for loyalty to service in government, he doesn't want to say things like that. And for the record, at this point at least, Jefferson, Jefferson's Treasury Secretary, Gallatin, Governor George Clinton, a significant Republican who goes to visit him, all believe Aaron Burr and take him at his word and don't expect him to make any such statement. But many Republicans, and we're talking about Jeffersonian Republicans, think that Burr should have made a statement swearing away the presidency. He doesn't. 36 ballots. Can't pick a president. According to a lead Federalist, a person named Bayard, who is going to cast the tie-breaking vote that's going to eventually make Jefferson president, they couldn't get Burr to even discuss the matter. They tried. So he wasn't intriguing with the Federalist, even if he was not saying anything at all. Weird situation. They were worried that maybe the Federalist and Burr would make a deal and keep Jefferson away from the presidency. Governor of Virginia James Monroe threatens to call out the militia. It's settled. Bayer cast the tie-breaking vote, and Jefferson's president. The amendment was passed because the initial system of picking a president and vice president, in that the runner-up became vice president wasn't working so well for the way things were really going. It was a nod to political reality and not idealistic thinking. It's all well and good to say that the runner-up should be the second in line, the second most popular person. And that's one of the things Federalists are going to argue against this 12th Amendment. If you use the runner-up, you're going to get a good person in that spot. Well, it wasn't working that well. In 1796, you ended up with Jefferson as vice president, Adams as president. They really didn't work together well for a variety of reasons but all having to do with politics, party politics. They tried a little bit, but it just didn't work. They're two opposite political forces that want different things. Each has politics to worry about. In 1800, you have this snafu. And so in 1803, it takes a little bit, Republicans in Congress decide to go for a 12th Amendment. DeWitt Clinton, who would end up running for president himself, is one of the sponsors in the Senate. John Dawson, Virginia Republican congressman, is a sponsor in the House. Senator White of Delaware, a Federalist, argues against it. He says, since people attach very little importance to the office of vice president, electors might be likely indifferent to the reputation and qualities of the candidate. But they really weren't arguing logic here. They were just trying to stop the amendment from being passed. Federalists at this point in 1803 
didn't have much chance of winning in 1804, but they hoped they might be able to kick the election to the House, and then they'd have some influence. They raise everything they can. Dayton raises his hand, makes an amendment to attach to this, to eliminate the vice presidency altogether. Another person wants to increase the representation in the House. These are all popular issues. And it's DeWitt Clinton's insistence in the Senate that they vote only on the matter at hand, the 12th Amendment alone that gets it through. Otherwise, all these poison pill bills would have passed. Passes Congress two-thirds, just barely. And then all the states, except for the Northeast Federalist states of Delaware, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, ratify the 12th Amendment. That's why now you pick a ticket. You pick a person for president, and that president knows that someone's running with him for vice president. I want to say something else. The 12th Amendment is not as innocuous as it seems. In a way, while it did kind of fix elections and that little quirky president-vice president selection thing, while it did avoid more presidential elections from going to the House, there are two things to say about it that we don't think about a lot now. One is what I just mentioned. I believe the framers of the Constitution, at the convention at least, wanted a few more elections to go to the House here and there. The House is supposed to be the representatives of the people and the best ones to be able to pick. They thought they definitely thought more elections were going there than has turned out to be the case. The second is that the Twelfth Amendment has enhanced partisan politics, enhanced the strength of parties in presidential elections, no doubt about it, because you're picking two people, and obviously, if you you have to collude in order to decide to pick those people. So there was a lot of talk when the Constitution was being debated about how it would help to avoid factions. The Twelfth Amendment actually reinforces faction to that extent. Okay, Tim Bobwe, SZ, who's actually been a fan of the show for some time and commenting for a long time. Thank you. This news of Sanders surging in the polls reminds me of two precedents. Gene McCarthy's unexpectedly strong results in New Hampshire led to LBJ dropping out. Could Sanders have the same effect on Hillary? Thanks, I'll take that first. There should be some surprises in Iowa or New Hampshire, at least one of them. It's not a lot. It can't be Iowa and New Hampshire without some kind of surprise. The surprise would be if there's no surprise. But these days, a seven-point win, which is what Lyndon Johnson got over Eugene McCarthy, would be celebrated, not seen as a sign of danger. If Hillary wins New Hampshire at this point, by even one point, it'll be seen as a Sanders stall because there's been so much talk in the press about he's surging in the polls. I would expect Sanders to win one or the other or both. And I think the news media right now and expectations of the political class are that there's still time to fight after that. South Carolina, Nevada, the Super Tuesday states, you know, this is where the battle's going to be fought. So I don't think much gets gained. Uh, if he wins both, I- if Sanders wins both Iowa and New Hampshire, you get some out of it. The, the states don't have the strength they used to have. Where in 1968, Lyndon Johnson wins, actually wins the primary and leaves the race for president. One thing to keep in mind, in, we're looking at Hillary Clinton's situation politically, where Obama really defeated Hillary Clinton in 2008. And remember, it was extremely close between the delegate counts of those two candidates in 2008. Where Obama really defeated her was by taking southern states, South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi. But this time around, I don't see a candidate that can do that. The most dangerous thing for Hillary Clinton in this situation is an African-American candidate, a Hispanic candidate, a woman candidate. Three large constituents of the Democratic Party. And something else. Those are constituencies that vote Democratic even in red states that don't go Democratic in the fall. So Alabama, Mississippi, South Carolina, Texas. These are places where there are a lot of delegates because it's based on the vote of the last three elections and you had Obama running. Hillary Clinton polls well with those three groups. Show me a candidate that will take her on in those groups and uh, I'll change the political prognosis. But all that being said, and you know, do what I do. I have a lot of Republican friends. I have a lot of Democratic friends. I have friends on all the spectrum and people that I talk to all over. I see it. I see the Sanders surge. Um, I'm not going to say I feel the burn, but I see the burn. So I'll go with it's too early to make predictions, but I think that's the situation as it is now. Uh, Tim Bobway SC says, Secondly, I saw an unsubstantiated rumor that the Brothers Coke were supporting Sanders on the sly. 
Similar rumors that some of Nader's support came from strategists on the right, heavily laundered contributions to draw votes away from the centrist Democrats, the ones that might win, probably without the candidate's knowledge or consent. William Poundstone's Gaming the Vote said, in a system set up for the two parties, the best strategy is for one side to support the extremists on the other. This is why most primary elections make you declare your party. Otherwise, people from Party A would vote for the most unelectable candidate for Party B, then rejoin the fold in time for the general election. Not a fair immoral strategy, but in pure game theory, it's the most effective. Care to elaborate, Bruce? Thanks, Zimbabwe. Here's the issue, though. I, I get the game theory thing, but it's hard to get thousands or millions of voters to go along with that game theory play like that. So, like, for instance... I'm thinking of the 2000 Michigan primary, and this is a primary where between George W. Bush and John McCain and voters in Michigan had the opportunity to pick one or the other. Well, a lot of Democrats entered that primary to vote for John McCain. I don't think they were trying to spoil the Republican Party. I think sometimes when the other party's going into the party's primary, right, when Democrats are entering a Republican primary, they're not always voting for the terrible troll, right? They're voting for the guy that they like more. So... 2012, for instance, I always think like the Democrats' favorite Republican was Huntsman. This year, it seems to be Kasich. But I guess I would, that, I would test it. Look at those. If there are some open primaries, look at them and see if Democrats go in and vote for Kasich or something like that. Okay. Now, on a smaller level, if you're just talking about donating or running an ad, yeah, I think some of this gaming does go on. In fact, I got more moved in this direction on this question. I used to think there's not as much of that going on, but I think there's a little more. Now, for instance... 2004, you had this whole big issue because Karl Rove goes to a parade in D.C., sees a bunch of Howard Dean marchers, and starts saying, hey, yeah, that's the one we want. Well, an environmental consultant who's aligned with the Democrats hears Karl Rove doing this. So there was this big rumor and this news story that, well, Karl Rove really wants Howard Dean to win because he's more beatable. And uh, that's on one side. Now, on the other side, you had Claire McCaskill, who in 2010 ran an ad for the primary opponent that she wanted, Todd Aiken. And basically what she did is she, when Todd Aiken's running in the primary and he's somewhere near the bottom, Claire McCaskill runs an ad and says, he's too conservative for Missouri. Well, oh, the calls they start getting from all these conservative people to Claire McCaskill headquarters. Well, if you don't like him, we're going to vote for him. Serves you right. Well, that's exactly what they wanted to happen. So Claire McCaskill actually spent more in the last two weeks of Todd Aiken's primary campaign than he did. He wins the nomination. Claire McCaskill is the most beatable opponent. He ends up saying something stupid about rape. Claire McCaskill wins the election. So this is done. I think the greatest example is Watergate. All right. Watergate entirely stems out of these type of thoughts. It was initially part of a Dirty Tricks campaign. And to get Nixon the best general election opponent, in that case, it was McGovern. They didn't want Ed Muskie. And it just kind of extended from there. That's what the plumber's unit was initially doing. And it kind of extended from there. And they never kind of stopped trying to game things, including going as far as bugging the Democratic National Headquarters to kind of see if McGovern's talking to Lawrence O'Brien, if the traditional Democrats and the McGovern Democrats are patching things up. You know, once they started it, they kind of couldn't stop, and that's where it went too far. We don't even know all the things that went on, but there certainly were a, a variety of activities that, that, that everything from making like outrageous statements about other candidates on one candidate's letterhead, but it's stolen, it's a fake press release, to having some control over the conservative Manchester Union uh, newspaper in New Hampshire and just blasting the heck out of Muskie and kind of leaving McGovern alone a little bit so that they softened him up. So things like this, you know, are we're definitely done, are definitely done. They can be very effective. I think you have absolutely a great right to question them morally. You know, as a democracy, we have to look at, are you really getting the best choice between two visions if you have this going on and should call out things and reporters should be on this and calling out stuff like that more. Brian Sudith writes, Bruce, what does history say about VPs getting the nomination and winning the election? How many two-term VPs never got the nomination? Okay. Well, uh, thanks, Brian. And 
Here's an interesting thing. When vice presidents want the nomination, it seems like they get it. So Nixon, Humphrey, George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush, Gore got the nominations of their party. Had Kennedy lived, I don't know if Lyndon Johnson would have got it. Mondale got the nomination as part of a one-term administration. And then when he ran as a former vice president, he got in 1984. However, it could be a little different this year if this question is about Biden and Clinton. Because 2016, different situation, previous VPs cleared out lesser people, were not challenged by a fellow member of their administration, right? Nixon works out a deal with Rockefeller, avoids a challenge. Goldwater was talking about challenging people, wanted him to, but in 1960, he did not. George H.W. Bush beat Senator Dole, Pat Robertson, and others, but didn't have a significant challenger from the Reagan administration. All right, that was Al Haig. Got less than 1% of the vote. He was only Secretary of State for two years, so wasn't actually particularly liked by a lot of the Reagan people. Al Gore was threatened by Richard Gephardt, who never did end up running, and he was challenged by Senator Bill Bradley, who did run, but didn't really get anywhere. He wasn't challenged by a member of the Clinton administration, nor would that have happened. So yeah, I think VPs, you know, they're having lunch on Fridays with the big guy. Uh, They're in a great position to control the party apparatus. Might be a little bit different in a year where you have a former Secretary of State from the Obama administration, kind of forcing the president's hand into some kind of neutrality, I would think, at least in the beginning, and be a Clinton. And the Clintons are one of the powerful forces in the Democratic Party establishment now, right? You have the Obama people and the Clinton. I mean, and then there's grassroots. So I think it makes it a little bit different situation than some of those other vice presidents had. But yes, throughout history, They're getting the nomination. Are they winning? Well, George H.W. Bush wins. It's fairly recent. It also eventually worked out for Nixon. He does win in 1968. Gore did win more votes. We mentioned before, didn't win the election. I guess it, it, to me, all that tells you is there's nothing particularly detracting about a vice president running, uh, especially in the modern era. When you get into the previous elections, I would say, you know, Martin Van Buren, he actually, he's a powerful figure in his own right. He's very powerful in the Albany Regency, controlling the politics of New York. That's important because Jackson is running from Tennessee. So you have South and North together. So Martin Van Buren is in a good position to do that. From 1836 to 1900, the vice president was not a factor in the presidential race, even if they were holding the presidential office because the previous president had died. Now, that particular thing was changed by Theodore Roosevelt, who in 1904 ran, and that that was unusual. And believe me, there were some forces that wanted to knock Roosevelt out of that spot in 1904. Had Mark Hanna, Ohio senator and boss, not passed away in 1904, I'm not sure Theodore Roosevelt would have got a free ride there. But because he did, he set the president, Calvin Coolidge, runs in 1924. And now I think the vice presidential office gets elevated a bit. And then the modern VPs in the Cold War era, they're stronger figures. They're getting their party's nomination more often. I think elections are about how the president is doing, even when the president's not on the ballot. Guess what? Obama's not on the ballot in 2016. The election's about him. And it doesn't matter if it's Clinton. doesn't matter if it's Biden. It matters a little if it's somebody like Sanders or on the other side, somebody like Trump, because you that may go in either direction. You may get this whirlwind of excitement for either of those candidates, or you might get a backlash just because of who they are. But even Sanders running on the Democratic ticket, it's still mostly an election about Obama. That's the way elections have gone historically. A distinction has become apparent to me over the nine years that I've done the show that wasn't when I began. I just started essentially talking into a microphone. And there's so many people with so many different podcasts now. And if the interesting thing is a lot of people will say, oh, Bruce, you, you, your show's kind of similar. Dan Carlin, was he an influence? Never listened to him when I started in 2006. It was afterward. Uh, so many mutual listeners 
that uh, I, st- I do listen to it from time to time, particularly Hardcore History, and certainly the blueprint for Armageddon, which had a big influence on me. World War I, the way that it should be told. And so I do like him a lot, but he wasn't an influence for the show because I hadn't really heard the program before. Uh, I will say that I worked with him on a couple of things, and uh, he was real helpful, for instance, when I was doing the Umbrella Man cast. And uh, he provided some helpful information on some of the military factors of what might have been required if Chamberlain had to go to war there and how that might have turned out. And uh, I like that because it helped to reinforce, so I, so I always appreciated his help on that. But uh, no, I just did this started organically. And I think really uh, what I was always thinking about is that I'd get so angry about this issue or that. And then the more I thought about history, it just kind of helped understanding and maybe released tension a little bit. But that's on major issues. There's something else, though. And that is that uh, you also see kind of events or political maneuvers, political tactics, statements from candidates and the like, political trends. But it also might let you know that something that a politician's doing is not the first time. And so you're seeing both in this questions discussion here, right? And uh, so we're going to talk, I think it's a lot of the the, the political trends, just because there's so much going on, we have a presidential election coming up. Raleigh Donahue writes, For the second time in our nation's history, we will have three consecutive presidents who will serve eight years. 96% of incumbents won their House seat or Senate race in 2014. I have to check that, but that's Raleigh saying that. I think that's right. The oldest president to assume office, Ronald Reagan, did so at age 69. Yet this year, three of our leading candidates are just as elderly, if not more so. Hillary Clinton, 69. Donald Trump, 70. Bernie Sanders, 75. Joe Biden, 74, who might make a run. Every poll shows that the majority of Americans are dissatisfied with our national political leaders. And yet the election results seem to favor familiar faces and political insiders. Thanks, Raleigh. Appreciate the question. Yeah, age first. Antibiotics, Lipitor, better health care, better preventive care, more knowledge of things that can hurt you. (laughs) Uh, All of this, I think, combines to help presidential politics when it comes to age. I was one of the few arguing that age was not an issue for John McCain in 2008, even made the New York Times in their blog because of that at that time. Now I want to take a little credit. John McCain is still among the living, and we hope, of course, that that continues. Had he been president, he would have survived his first term just fine, could have made a decision at that point whether to run or not. And if he did run for a second term, as far as we know, he'd still be in it, almost near the end. Having said all that, the average age that Americans elect presidents at is somewhere in the 50s. So this is a little unusual. Uh, The other side of it, though, Rubio at 44, Walker at 47, O'Malley at 52, they're not charting that much. And Rubio a little. So age isn't showing up as the positive or negative. I think if you're fed up about student loans, a 75-year-old who's fed up about student loans is good enough for you, even if you know he's not going to community college. And if you like what Donald Trump is saying, you're not going to ask him to run on a treadmill. In terms of the three sets of two terms, it's rare. It only happened that one time. Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, the so-called too much Virginia. And there was a lot of question, by the way. Madison had a nasty fight with Dewey Clinton in 1812. So he almost broke that chain. But there was a lot of talk about that they were all from Virginia and there was too much Virginia. And there was even talk of adding an amendment to the Constitution that the next president has to be from a different state. Didn't do it. I think the one thing to look at, though, in the modern era, it's more likely for a president to run two terms. All right. Parties don't want to nominate candidates to run one. I know there's like talk about it from time to time. I mean, McCain kind of hinted at it. Hillary Clinton talked about it. Biden, there were rumors that he would think about it one year, you know, one term. It's not good for a party because I think it's because they know there's a slight advantage to being the president of the United States in that next election. Who wants to give that up? So I don't know. It's possible that whoever wins this 2016 is going to have a real tough time in 2020 trying to get four second terms in a row, four reelected presidents in a row. But I still think it comes back to the basics. If things are good in 2020, people aren't going to think about what they did in 1996. They're not going to do that. The other thing is I think you had a bit of a political release valve. So if the argument is that we've had like three sets of three 
reelected presidents, therefore we should feel oppressed or something like that. But there's been a party switch in there. So Clinton, Obama, and in the middle, you had a Republican, George W. Bush. There's also been a switch in Congress. So you had uh, 1994, you had a Republican Congress, 2006, Democrats took over, 2010, Republicans took over again. So there's been a back and forth there. On the point about Congress, it might be true that, you know, 95% of incumbents get reelected, but the margin is where it matters. So you can, in some cases, win 25 seats and take back the House, or 40 seats and take back the House. And everybody knows it. And once you take back the House, you get the Speaker, and the Speaker's a very powerful office. So in a way, you don't need that stat, the 95%, to change that much to change American policy, to make voters happy, say, right? Eric C. Bacchus writes, Bruce, I appreciate greatly your efforts in your enemies podcast, a.k.a. Nixon Goes to China, as being discussed and debated on your site. I am posting separately. As you proceed through the cast in your analysis, you do a comparison between the Iran deal and Nixon's efforts, and then go to submit that there are distinct contrasts. One of the compelling contrasts that you omit, however, is your early podcast allowance that only Nixon could go to China. I submit that one of the problems that exists in the current context is that Obama personally, and also his administration more generally, do not have the gravitas that Nixon and his administration had in foreign policy in the Cold War era. You do well in illustrating that Nixon had strong credentials of being an anti-communist, and as such had the capability of developing a rapprochement with Red China, if you will. He had a coffer of cred that had been built by being tough through the 60s. Obama's team really lacked that kind of bank of real politic, and Kissinger and Nixon had it. For that reason, the trepidation and criticism is much more pronounced regarding the Iran deal than it ever was for opening up to Red China in 1972. Again, great efforts and continue the work. I would say that I was surprised that you're editorializing on the deal, given your normal track, but it's not surprising that you helped to illuminate the current politics in the light of the Nixonian deal with China when we were in the throes of the Vietnamese conflict and still very much engaged in the struggle with the Soviet Union. Thanks for your efforts. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Eric. Uh, much appreciated. Yeah, it's not uh, my politics will beat up your politics, so you're not going to hear too much editorializing from Bruce Carlson. Uh, I may not be opinionated, but I am opinioned. Issues of war, peace, health care, things like the filibuster or representation in Congress, those are areas where I'm a little more likely to weigh in. I, I don't think I influenced any senators on that. Um, I thought about the only Nixon could go to China thing. Even I, I even went as far as to almost name that cast Kennedy Goes to China, which was a reference to both the fact that he almost did and that the administration is not Nixon. And Obama as a left centrist has less gravitas, as you mentioned, as a right wing administration would. I mean, George W. Bush probably could have gone to Iran any time, right? In a way he did, because his administration began the negotiating process. Now, in a way, he didn't because he wasn't involved in the negotiation. He, he wasn't the one actually making some of these determinations in the deal. But starting the process, yes. George W. Bush, there would be a lot less controversy, but there, I think there still would be a little. I'll add a few points. While I think you're correct on the contrast, no doubt, Nixon did face danger going to China political danger and geopolitical danger. The first opening with China, for instance, before the announcement, brought criticism from a group of right-wing businessmen associated with Reagan, who was his rival a bit in a pre-Watergate, maybe a potential successor. Reagan had run against Nixon in 1968. So, and then William Buckley's attack was not just him writing in the National Review, though that was a source of right-wing commentary at the time, but it was also a big group of the right-wing elements, the associ leaders of associations in the party. There was some geopolitical trouble, too. Japan hated the move. They were scared of this. They didn't trust China. We were their shield against China. It's also possible that Nixon could have ruined the Soviet game. See, we agree and look back with hindsight that Nixon was probably right, that by opening up China, the Soviets come to the table. Well, it could have went the other way. The Soviets could have decided, well, you're talking to them. We're done. And now we're holding China's hand and we don't have the Soviets. So it was a risk. He faced risks. I guess what I mean to say is Nixon could go to China, not only because only Nixon could go to China based on his previous policies and his 
anti-communist cred. But only Nixon could go to China because he was also very good. But a criticism of all that might be, well, if only Nixons can go to China, so to speak, uh, then presidents can only make surprising policy decisions. They can only operate in the theater they're not expected to. And that's not going to work for the United States of America and its foreign policy. The president has to seize opportunities when they're in front of them. The other point I'd make is Nixon used surprise. That's something that is not available at all to current White House occupants. It's not going to happen. He also used his executive power. A president can say, I'm going to China. I'm getting an Air Force One. I'm going to China now. That's in the presidential realm. The deal requires more congressional participation. There wasn't a big congressional debate before Nixon went to Ch- goes to China. He's getting in the plane and doing it. Had there been one, I think you would have seen more hay made. Not from the Democrats in Congress, maybe a little, like, you know, oh, you should have uh, consulted me, kind of like what Fulbright was doing. Oh, you should have consulted us more or something like that. But you would have gotten it from the, the right wing in Congress and they would have had the television cameras to do it. That wasn't really done in a big way. He didn't have that opportunity. Chad Gorlick writes, any podcast on the relationship between Nixon and Kissinger, in particular the mistrust, you made a comment on it on the recent episode. Oh yeah, Chad, I mean, <laughs> Nixon and Kissinger. Robert Dalek does a great job in his book. He's a presidential historian. Nixon and Kissinger, but just reading some of the things from that and other stories, I mean, you just have this constant jealousy between Nixon and Kissinger. Nixon is worried that Kissinger's going to get all the credit for the foreign policy of his administration. And by the way, he wasn't that far off. In history, we do think about the two. But I think one story that just sticks out is Kissinger finds out that Time Magazine is going to put them both on the cover, Nixon and Kissinger, men of the year. And he calls up Time Magazine, please don't do that. It's going to make my life hell. (laughs) Time Magazine, based on Kissinger's call, know that this is the real story. These two men work together to make uh, to make the to to make the visit with China happen. And both of them should be on the magazine. That's the real news story in their opinion. So they make a clay statue and they have both of their faces and they're both the men of the year. I'm sure Nixon wasn't happy about it. There are other references on tapes and in the margins of his uh, memos where he'd write instructions to Haldeman and the others, you know, that uh, keep him away from time. The magazines are going to want him on it. He's not to talk to them. They're worried about Kissinger leaking. He did leak. He was well known to talk to reporters. I don't think he did anything with the China trip that would have jeopardized it, but he was well known to talk to reporters. There's a little margin, like marginal instructions to uh, haul them in, like, make sure Henry doesn't get a big head out of this. He makes boo-boos too. And I'll tell one last story. I had mentioned on that cast about how Kissinger takes this kind of mysterious trip to Paris and to Pakistan and India and visiting all these hotspots, and secretly he's going to China. And he makes it on a plane that's just a normal army uh, command plane. It's loaded with boxes. It's uncomfortable. And I said that was to disguise the mission. And it was, but really, this is at Nixon's insistence. And part of the reason he was flying on that plane, too, is that Nixon did not want Kissinger flying around the world in a VIP plane. That was for the President of the United States. And then, of course, we talked about how Nixon held everyone back from walking down those stairs until he and Pat Nixon had. I mean, that's kind of standard presidential stuff. But this was a relationship, I think, of... Trust and mistrust, because the two did trust each other to an extent. I mean, Kissinger was responsible for giving Nixon some information during the 1968 campaign while he was working in the National Security Agency. We know that from some of the Nixon tapes. I don't know the the details of everything that he said, but we know there's comments. Kissinger's like, well, you know I helped you out in the campaign and things like that. Nixon trusted Kissinger with more foreign policy than anyone else, including his own Secretary of State. So obviously there was some level of trust there. It's just that there was also this little bit of uh, jealousy, rivalry, and who's going to get the fame. And uh, after Watergate, Kissinger did sort of steal the show and uh, was running Middle East policy, continued under Ford as Secretary of State. So Kissinger's remembered as well as Nixon for a lot of the policy, both in China and with the Soviet Union. I referenced earlier about the 
son who didn't listen to his father and the father told him, you know, don't invade England. And only, if only Charles Edward Stuart would have listened, he wouldn't have had such a bad life. Although, since he didn't listen, he got a statue out of the deal. Is there any other country in the world that honors and commemorates the leaders of a failed rebellion? Well, I, I think I know why this question is being asked, and it's probably because there's such a debate in the country right now over the Confederate war monuments, the Confederate flags being pulled from state houses and the like, and what do we do with uh, monuments? And really, you need to look no further than the House of Commons, the House of Parliament. And there is a statue of Oliver Cromwell. There are statues of various roundheads of the English Civil War. So it is not uncommon that a country might forgive and forget, sort of, and build statues about people who led lost causes. And if you want to say, okay, yeah, but Bruce Cromwell actually supported the constitutional monarchy or supported the parliament, that's why his statue's there, uh, certainly wasn't a proponent of the kingdom. If you go to England now, if you go to Derby, you will see a statue of Charles Edward Stuart. And he is a man who invaded Great Britain, tried to take London, tried to take the throne. And yet, there's a statue of him, and in fact, there's a society that uh, honors his legacy and the statue. After the Glorious Revolution, 1688, William of Orange comes from Netherlands and takes over the throne of England. This is to restore the Protestant religion to England. And uh, the Stuarts were accused of being too close to Catholicism. And indeed, after the Stuarts are forced off the throne, the Pope proclaims a kingdom of England and Scotland under the Stuarts. But they're not really able to exercise anything because they can't get to the island. Um, they can't get to Great Britain at all. So um, even trying to go to France sometimes is an issue or going to countries in Europe because the British diplomats object. His father warns Charles, don't, don't try to invade England. You know, you're, you, it's, it, 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 we're, we're settled here. Let the diplomacy happen. If we're going to take the throne, it's going to happen through diplomacy. But there's a group of Scots who get together and they get word to Charles Edward Stuart, who's, you know, known as the Bonnie Prince, Bonnie Prince Charlie. And they say, you know, look, if you can get 3,000 soldiers from France, come here, we'll get a Scottish army together, and we're going to march on London and put you back on the throne. Honor your family. He borrows or probably takes money from his mother. They get about 700 people. Unfortunately, well, he does reach Scotland. He doesn't even, he's not even, the, the ship with the 700 people doesn't make it. So Charles, Edward Stuart, and seven men land on a Scottish island, and he leads the second Jacobite rising in his father's name. He takes Perth. He takes Edinburgh, almost unopposed. British army is set up into Scotland to get him, and he beats him. He co holds court at Holyrood Palace for five weeks, and he's told oh, there's an English uprising. His army from Scotland marches to the town of Derby, almost enters London, except that there's fighting among him and his generals about what to do. They end up giving their opponents enough time to rally, and a British army is sent, defeats them. Charles Edward Stuart flees, goes back to France, then back to Rome, a broken man. If Bernie Sanders receives the Democratic nomination, would that affect President Obama endorsing him? Because he's a socialist. Okay, thanks for the question. Uh, should Bernie Sanders receive the Democratic Party nomination? Absolutely. President Obama would endorse him. It's rare in history for a sitting president not to endorse the nominee of his party. Everyone does it. The only one I can think of is in 1896, Grover Cleveland didn't endorse William Jennings Bryan, and William Jennings Bryan didn't want his endorsement. Cleveland was hard money. Bryan was soft money. They each had their own Democratic conventions. Cleveland supported another ticket. Right? That's not normal, and it didn't work, too, for the party, so they lost that election. But on to the meat of the question. Bernie Sanders is not really a socialist. He's uh, self-described as a democratic socialist. He's running in the Democratic Party. He was supported by the Democratic Party and the DSCC when he ran for Senate in Vermont. He's long caucused with the Democrats, even when he was running as an independent. 
in Vermont during some of his congressional runs. In the past, he was a member of an anti-war liberty party, the Vermont Progressive Party, or he's run as independent. Uh, Some of those parties in the 70s and 80s had connections with socialist groups. None of them were actually called socialist, and he's never run as a socialist in that name on the ballot. And if Bernie Sanders wins the Democratic nomination, there will be many socialist candidates running against him. So he will be a Democrat, and yes, I believe he'd be endorsed by Obama. It's an interesting question. You know, Vermont is probably the one state out of the 50 where being a socialist is actually a great vote-getter. Has a sitting VP ever been renominated for the position? Okay, so one VP under two presidents. Yes, that's happened, but it's been a while. Uh, first of all, I know why you're asking this, and that's... Uh, <laughs> Could Biden, for instance, just stay in the job? Well, it has happened twice. George Clinton, who was a governor of New York and a leading uh, Jeffersonian Republican figure, very powerful figure in early America, not well remembered now. His son, DeWitt Clinton, was also mayor of the city of New York and governor of New York, candidate for president as well. I know the big question. Were they related to Bill Clinton, we know, or Hillary Clinton, uh, Well, keep in mind, Clinton's such a common name. It's based on Glinton, same word, Glinton, Clinton, family name in England. Uh, They're not relatives as far as we know. They could be, of course, distant relatives, but nothing. uh... George Clinton served as a vice president for both Jefferson, and then he was renominated and served under Madison as well before his death. John C. Calhoun served for both John Quincy Adams and for Jackson as well. So in 1824, he ran with John Quincy Adams. Actually, interestingly enough, he was running with both of them. He was going to be VP whether Jackson or Adams won. And in 1828, he switched and ran under Jackson only. Calhoun didn't get along with Jackson very well, and that's why there was an opening, and he was replaced in 1833 by Martin Van Buren. Ford almost became Reagan's vice president in 1980, which meant he would have been renominated or would have served under another president. He had served for Nixon under Nixon previously. It was a discussion at the convention. It got very close. They just simply couldn't agree. Ford wanted something akin to a co-presidency. He wanted a say over foreign policy. He wanted influence the National Security Council. He wanted Kissinger to be in the Reagan administration. There was a lot that he wanted beyond what a normal vice president would ask for. Reagan and his team just weren't comfortable with it. Now, in terms of this happening again, like a a vice president just staying in office um, and running again on the ticket under his party's nominee, I think the trouble is that, as we mentioned earlier, vice presidents like to run for president now. And a year ago, I would have thought, you know, Biden's a good candidate for this. He might just stay in the job. He seems like a very happy vice president, seems to enjoy the office. Now there's a lot of talk of him running for president. More serious than it used to be. But let's say he doesn't run. And let's say, you know, here's a scenario where I could see it happening. Hillary Clinton gets the nomination. She's going to pick someone else. If Bernie Sanders gets the nomination, I think then this becomes a very good prospect because you got kind of Washington experience in a can. I mean, Sanders has been a senator and congressman a long time, but you've got kind of a guy that's an operator, an insider, along with the party nominee. So I think it would work very well, if Biden's willing to do it, and I, I just don't know. M.J. Shepard writes, If you haven't already, Bruce, have you done a post-war history of the GOP nomination process? It would make a good show. There have been only three examples since 1952 of the next-in-line not getting the nomination. My prediction based on this is that Jeb Bush will be the nominee. Thanks, MJ. I think it's a good observation. I think you've really, I'll talk about it in a bit why, but I think you've put together the way to understand the election on the GOP side. A good ruler to use. But let's look at it. It does seem the party tends to fall in line rather than fall in love. Well, the Democrats kind of fall in love. They've got this great speaker from the prairie who's taken the country by storm. 
and Republicans really tend to be some form of, okay, what are we doing this time around? Who's the guy we're going for? A little bit more organized. It's an older party. It's a party that has a lot of support among business people who think this way. And it's a party that's not as academic as the other party. And all those things are generalizations. I get it. But we're talking about a generalization because you also have some Republicans who go for the silver tongue and try to, you know, move people. 1952, the candidate everyone expects is Nixon. He runs. 1964, that's the first break in the chain and you have Goldwater election. Kind of a surprise, although technically Goldwater had come in second with a very few delegates in the 1960 convention. To 1968 and it's Nixon again. 1976 is a little different. It's Ford. Well, that's probably the dude with Watergate. Though Reagan runs and Reagan had run in the 1968 election. Reagan challenges Ford in 1976, then runs in 1980 and wins. Bush challenges Reagan in 1980, then runs in 1988 and wins. Dole challenges Bush in 1988, then runs in 1996 for the nomination, doesn't win the election. Here's your next break that you mentioned. There were three breaks in this chain because Pat Buchanan comes in second in 96. Party's not going to vote for him. In 2000, George W. Bush. John McCain had challenged George Bush in 2000 and 2008. John McCain wins the nomination. Romney challenges McCain in 2008. In 2012, Romney wins the election. With the Democratic Party, it's so different. Think about this. The last three Democratic presidents were not known 10 years before their election that well. Bill Clinton in 1982, governor of Arkansas, pretty obscured. In fact, he had just come back from defeat. Barack Obama in 1998, state senator in Illinois. Jimmy Carter in 1966, a state legislature, a, a state legislator in Georgia. Now, Jeb Bush didn't run against Romney in 2012, but I don't think Mike Huckabee is going to get the nomination. So we're going to have some kind of a minor break here. But I think I get your point. In other words, Jeb Bush is kind of the establishment candidate. And yes, as a president's brother and a president's son at the same time, I keep bringing this up. There are so many friends out there that are going to help you in caucuses and primaries. There's so many people that got a job as a result of one of those two presidents. So Jeb Bush has that advantage. I haven't been enamored with his performance as a candidate. And I think we haven't brought it up yet, and we should. Donald Trump has changed the dynamic in the early race, and it is indeed early. One of the things I think Trump has done is expose somebody like a Jeb Bush to have to perform more. And sometimes that's great. You know, you always hear that old adage like, I'm glad I had a challenger because it made me better. Well, well, that works if it works. But it's also kind of exposed how Jeb Bush deals with a challenger. And some strategic voters in the party might say, well, if he's not doing well against Trump, how is he going to do against the Clintons? We should be looking at this as a normal election, and Jeb Bush should get the nomination unless something extraordinary happens. And something extraordinary happened in 1964. So the real question, is this 1960 or is it 1964? Does the guy we expect to get it wins? Or is there a new dynamic force that's going to sweep primaries, that's going to take the convention? Way too early to predict. I will say that my opinion of Donald Trump in this race has changed, say, from since July. And one thing I've observed both personally and kind of people I come into contact and then polls and things that I've seen is that there is some real grassroots support. So it's not just Donald Trump sending Twitters out there all day. There's real grassroots support. Kind of people who put in lawn signs, who go to coffee clutches, who are going to be in the Iowa caucus and in other places, they like Donald Trump. And it's very simple. It's the issue of immigration. And the issue of immigration in that group say Tea Party if you want, say Grassroots if you want, I think is so powerful because it stems into everything else. That issue will be used by the core grassroots Republicans on anything. If you talk about the economy, they'll say, well, if our jobs weren't be stolen, the economy would be better. Talk about national security. It's like, well, we fixed the immigration problem. That'll help security. So you can bring it into almost everything. I think it's the number one issue for that group. And you could say the deficit too, but I think that's too far removed from them. That's the other thing. It's such a personal issue. So 
they'd probably use that too. Well, if we fixed immigration, we wouldn't have as big a deficit. You know, So I think for that group, he, in a very credible way, established his position on that issue that is most important to them. And I think that a lot of the attacks are coming at these side issues like, well, he's not really a Republican. He's going to raise taxes. He likes socialized medicine. But I think he made himself, through comments that I would consider vile, but I think he made himself utterly credible to that group of the core grassroots Republicans. Let's see what happens. But this is the question early out. Is it 64 or is it 60? I definitely have a mixed view on hypotheticals, but I enjoy taking hypothetical questions on more as a thought experiment to both test how we understand the history and how politics today might work. But you have to be careful with them. If you remove one thing, it's not so easy to predict all the events that might happen. So we're always just pursuing the most logical course, right? With that in mind, I got this. Who would have gotten the Democratic nomination in 1976 if Jimmy Carter did not? And, you know, some people are going to look at this and answer quickly and say Jerry Brown, who was then the governor of California, because he was technically number two in terms of delegates in 1976. But I think that's more because people know him now. Then he was just a two-year governor of California. Some say George Wallace, because he was a contender too, but I do not think based on his behavior on the civil rights issue, that George Wallace would have been the nominee of the Democratic Party, particularly in 1976. I think you have to go to Senator from Washington State, Henry Scoop Jackson, hawkish Democrat, leads the contenders in my estimate. He has enough second place finishes in the early primaries where Carter won and two big outright wins in the beginning, New York and Massachusetts, to suggest that he would be the beneficiary if Carter was not in the race. You also have to look at timing here. Henry Scoop Jackson was a candidate that ran in the early going in the primaries of 76, and when Carter took all the oxygen out, he left. Without Carter, he stays in. However, I wouldn't be able to tell you that the so-called senator from Boeing, because he was such a supporter of that company in the Senate, would have enough jet fuel to stop a brokered convention in 76. Jackson winning or brokered convention are the two most likely outcomes. I think that for a couple of reasons. If Carter was, in 1976, an attempt to moderate the Democratic Party after McGovern had lost and Democrats got together and said, we have to do something different, but not go so hard right that Wallace is the nominee, say, and if you want to do something a little different than Nixon and Watergate, then Jackson fits right in. The right combo of social liberal and foreign policy hawk to make a credible run of independent general election voters. Jackson was close to the Kennedys and was shortlist consideration for the 1960 VP ticket for that reason. He could play South, he could play North, he knew Carter, and it was Carter who placed his name and nomination in 1972 as part of a Stop McGovern effort. But it's not clear, though, if Jackson could clinch the deal in time for the convention. And New York 1976 might have been brokered. I don't think Jackson has Dasher's energy. His sense of density wouldn't solidify from that unique phenome effect of Jimmy Carter, the peanut farmer who will never lie to you, who appeared on Newsweek in time at the same time when he won Iowa. Jackson made a very poor decision not running in New Hampshire, though he got a small percentage of the vote there anyway. Assuming he made the same choice, that would allow a contest from Mo Udall and would open up a battle between he and Udall and George Wallace with Wallace winning the Southern States, Udall winning the North. Jackson would be in a great spot to win second everywhere and win a few. He wins New York, Massachusetts, likely win in Pennsylvania, because that's where Carter beat him, knocked him out of the race. He would likely be second place in Florida, Wallace gets first, and that would have arguably been seen as a win because he was winning the anti-Wallace vote in the, in the Southern States. So most Southern States would have, I believe, given him momentum, while Udall cleaned up smaller primaries and won accolades among liberals. It's possible that if Jerry Brown enters the race, he may or may not. Jerry Brown came into the race in 76 as part of a Stop Carter movement. Did fairly well, won a few states, but it was too late. With Brown, Church, and Humphrey taking a few states, if all those candidates enter, it might go to a convention. And this is not a shocking event in 1976. This is what would happen to the GOP between Ford and Reagan in 76. Decision made at the convention. 
But in the Democratic Party in 1976, if Jackson or anyone else didn't win a clear, convincing win, you had Ted Kennedy and Hubert Humphrey waiting in the wings, sort of. And either one of them could have, uh, even though they weren't technically running, they could have been candidates. Nine years of doing my history can beat up your politics. And I really mean that in both ways. It can beat up your sense of how politics are in terms of the game of politics, which I love. And it can beat up your politics, too, in terms of how you view issues. If we talk about the history behind issues more, I shouldn't be changing your opinion on most things, but I could increase the complexity through which you view issues. I could I could change how you debate with others. Every episode I do might not change anything at all or beat up anything at all, but I think over time, in the long term, if you're listening to this program, it's got to beat up your politics a bit. I'm sure glad I didn't call it History Sandwich. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. If you can donate, please do. There's a link there for that. Thanks for listening.